morning, good evening, everyone. Uh, hello, Zivkon. Today I'm going to take you to Africa to talk about African financial threats. So about the threat groups that are targeting banks to uh, conduct cyber heists. Uh, just to explain you why such topic, why not another APT topic about the cyber espionage intrusions. Um, mainly because last year um, I did a big change in my life. I left the military military sector and I joined private sector at the international bank. And I was absolutely challenged with my knowledge about threat groups that are financially motivated. And my current employer is present on many international markets uh, globally in Asia, Middle East, and also in Africa. So I decided to um, understand more of the threats that are uh, coming from the that landscape. So today I'm taking you to Kenya, where most of the of those prolific groups come from, and we'll try to understand their modus operandi and very unique uh, kill chain of intrusions um, that's connected with African origin uh, threat groups. So for today's agenda, I prepared following points. At first, we'll focus on this on these unique tactics from the past intrusions, the, the so-called African kill chain, because this is quite unique for those groups and different from um other operations globally later on we'll focus on things that differentiate those groups we will try to understand the threat landscape and the clustering of those groups uh, what differentiate them and also we'll talk about some history uh, and some developments of those groups and the third point are two case studies focus on uh, analyzing the capabilities for example python keyloggers which are very common among those groups and we're trying to understand the origin and the development of, the, of those keyloggers and lastly we'll try to understand the capabilities and infrastructure of the grab zone threat group um, and we will focus on one of the IPs that is associated with this group in 2020. And we'll try to understand capabilities that were projected using that infrastructure. Just a few words about me. Uh, I served uh, about 16 years in Polish armed forces. I started uh, in Polish Navy and ended in uh, National Cybersecurity Center, Poland. Uh, now I'm working as a senior manager for cyber threat intelligence at Standard Chartered. And probably some of you may ask who threat intel analyst is. So this is generally somebody who tries to connect the dots, who tries to understand the capabilities and tries to understand threats uh sometimes connecting the uh, making looking for the patterns looking for the human fingerprints that are left by adversaries often it is very similar to uh searching for a needle in the haystack sometimes you you get lost uh, in a rabbit hole but sometimes uh, when you are successful you can try to find out the pattern and that pattern can help you to understand those threat groups and to proactively track them. Um, and a disclaimer for this presentation is that they, those opinions are solely my own and they do not represent my employer's position. And generally, uh, the investigation, uh, especially the two case studies, are based on publicly available data. And I have to uh, underlined the samples, the, the clustering of threat groups and the naming convention is thanks to Onet Services. I will refer to this um, group, to this company uh, in several places during my presentation because uh, this is the 
those are the people and the company that inspired me to that research when I decided to focus on Africa. It is a, a group of people who support targeted uh, organizations. And this is a, they provide very unique services apart from incident response services. They are also authorized by government to conduct offensive actions against um, those uh, threat groups. And many of the samples, many of the threat data also come from those uh, offensive cyber enabled operations. And I have to underline here that they are very uh, brave people because they are fighting those threats there locally, often with uh, close proximity to, to the threat groups that are, um, that are very dangerous that, uh, and the, the risk is real for them. So let's begin with understanding the African threat kill chain because this is something very unique. And when most of the uh, cyber intrusions that we know globally are um, conducted remotely, often the intrusion vector is spear phishing. So this is not the case for the, for the African kill chain because the initial foothold is gained using the uh, rock devices that are attached by insiders, by bribed personnel, disgruntled, disgruntled people who are instructed by the members of the cyber gangs to attach them somewhere uh, to the network of the targeted organization. So actually those intrusions are very targeted. People are instructed to, to attach those devices uh, into the into those networks and if you look to the mitra attack matrix there is such a uh, technique in the initial access tactic it is called hardware additions but um, if you check there, there there are not many examples for example uh, there is only one threat group mentioned there dark vision which is a eastern european uh, threat actor associated with intrusions in the uh, in Europe against Eastern European banks. So uh, we can see on this example that in public um, domain, we don't have m many examples, usually because um, remote intrusions is, is actually the beauty of cyber operations. Um, it is very useful for espionage organizations because it is, um, it is cheap, uh, the risk of catching is, is very low. Um, and that's why so many actors use those remote attacks. However, in Africa, most of the, most of the attacks are enabled by the, the rock devices specially prepared. And that's the way how uh, actors gain access to the, to the victims. So we, we can also say that uh, the intruders will get in. So um, the approach um, that assume breach that is very um, actual there. And it's, uh, it means that threat hunting and look proactive searching for the threat actor that's already operating in our environment is something is something that should be a priority for organizations that conduct business, for example, financial institutions that are uh, present at, uh, in this region. The next step, when the adversary uh, attaches the, the laptop, is, of course, the reconnaissance. And probably you are interested uh what kind of laptop is this so this is usually the laptop wi with windows operating system with a commercially available co so commercial of the shell um software for remote access tools so it could be for example go to my pc uh, it could be team viewer it could be any desk so they usually deploy the very easy to install and easy to operate um applications for remote access control uh, 
um, with graphical interface. And usually those insiders are trained how to, um, how to attach the laptop, how to troubleshoot. Those laptops usually have uh, disabled suspension or hibernation mode, so they, so they never sleep. When they get access and there is a command control established with a quite simple mean, the next step would be to go laterally. And apart from those command and control uh, software, there is also a software to scan the network, to crack the passwords, to move laterally. And for example, if they get some passwords to move laterally, they use old good PSXX. So in this case, they, they do not differ from um, prolific groups, espionage groups that also use that kind of software. Um, and when they move laterally, what else they do? Oh, for reconnaissance, you have also the images of Bloodhound and CME. So, so the projects which are open source and are freely available for reconnaissance and for attacking Active Directory environments. And if they, if they find interesting stations, they install keyloggers. This is also something very typical for them. I uh, use the citation from Phineas Fisher, another threat actor, that the reality is that Mimikatz and keyloggers view all passwords equally. And that's true. So they usually they do not focus on dumping passwords and um, those kinds of techniques. They usually deploy keyloggers and we'll focus on some uh, details of those keyloggers later on during the case studies. And the, those keyloggers are very popular uh, for all the groups. Uh, and, and they were invented years ago and with really slight differences in the code, uh, they are being continuously um, used in the intrusions. So finally, when the actors get the passwords to the critical systems, then they enable uh, access and they, for example, um, um, so, so the intrusions, the, here we focus on the technical part, but actually there is not only one insider during the cyber intrusion, usually there are more. And for example, uh, other insider threats could be people who are um, who have access to the account systems and they create account accounts with um, and closely before the intrusion begins some um, the ATM cards for those accounts are being taken out of the bank and they are being delivered to the money mules so um, during the operations uh, intruders are focused to gain maximum access to the critical system so they can um, allow transactions to those money mule accounts without the limits so there is no alerts and also the cash outs from the ATMs could be done without the limitations. Everything is organized, it could be like uh, even hundreds uh, or tens hundreds of money mules when the operators uh, get the access and the, the money mules operate in different regions they go to different cities sometimes they cross bo borders and they cash out the money mule accounts if it's really good to understand the history of those groups for example in 2014, the big cartel was formed. It was called Fork Bombo Cartel. It was created in Kasarani, which is kind of a cyber criminal Silicon Valley. Uh, it is a ghetto area of uh, Nairobi when there are many people, uh, many um, criminals from Nigeria, from South Africa. And there was a man who was a former policeman, a DCI, who formed this Fork Bombo Cartel from the smaller groups and they were quite prolific for years. Then, then they split due to some arrests. So generally, if we would take the diamond model for this group, it was a group that was operated in East Africa 
it was um, created by the policemen. And what is very important, those groups are have often the support of the local governments, of the police, of the corrupted policemen. So it's very hard for the defenders and for the targeted organizations to uh, fight those threats. What kind of capabilities they used? So they used commercial of the shell rats like Team Viewer, Go to PC, Metasploit, PS Empire. They use Seduke, which is a Python Python based um, rat. They use Quasi rat, which is available on, on the GitHub. Of course, they use the Python keyloggers. And they use insiders, mostly from the ICT personnel. Uh, and very often they used third party infrastructure. For example, they exfiltrated the key logging uh, to, to Gmail uh, and the victims, for example, banks, but also some SACOs, other financial institutions. And they were very prolific until the arrests, which happened in 2017. And the big cartel was arrested, but many of the members uh, managed to escape. So five smaller groups were created then, like Silent Cards, Grab Zone, smaller version of Fork Bombo, Fork Bombo Group, the Doctors and the, the Telecode. And some of the groups were fighting each other, some were cooperating. Uh, for example, the, the Grab Zone Group was uh, very close to the people that were connected uh, previously with Fork Bombo Cartel. Later on, they some of the people from Grabzone and the old money mills created the Fork Bombo Group in 2018. On the other hand, the, there was Silent Cars that was not co cooperating that much with uh, uh, other groups that split with them. Later on, even Silent Cars split to their consultants and their to Rui Ru Shepherds. And for example, the person who created Silent Cards for Bombo Cartel and the consultants is still the same person. So he, he managed to escape and created next groups uh, conse con consequently. And finally, the Fork Bombo group was terminated at the end of 2019. There was there was arrest um, when they tried to hack one of the biggest banks in East and Central Europe, uh, sorry, Africa. And they were for also, uh, it was a great operation um, all from the defender's perspective, but also it was quite a big event for the attackers because they even joined with Rui Ru Shepherds then, and some members of the Rui Ru Shepherds were also arrested uh, during this um, police action. Uh, how it looks in 2020, so many, nothing is stable. Th those groups are mixing with each other. Rui Ru grabs on consultants are regrouping. Um, and this is the East Africa threat landscape. However, on the other ha hand, we have also groups from West Africa, like Corzeta, and this is also a very interesting story because um, there are some links that they, uh, they operate with TA505, uh, which is a very prolific group. We could hear today uh, Vitaly's presentation about the cooperation between uh, this group and and Lazarus, so uh, always those cooperations between different threat actors is very interesting to, to research. And this is the, the timeline, and this timeline and this history also affected the, uh, the development and the modus operandi of those groups, and we'll show it on the example of the keyloggers. <clears throat> let's, fo let's focus on some details about um some of the groups for example silent cards uh, it has lots of members also east african gang um capabilities again they they use um go to pc any pc cdu but the new version new updated version and the keylogger uh, which is called land cruiser land cruiser but very similar to the old keyloggers of the fork bombo 
in, in this case, so in the case of silent cars, they use insiders, but it doesn't have to be uh, ICT personnel. It could be anyone with access. And sometimes it happened that even a janitor could enable an access to, to those groups and connect the, the laptop somewhere uh, to the network. They have very fast operational tempo. Uh, they use also a lot of cloud services like exfiltrating, uh, key logging to, to FTP, Drive HQ, to Gmail. They have quite wide targeting, for example, not only financial institutions, but also insurance sector, also hospitals. <clears throat> The group called the consultants. So the next group created by the same uh, guy who um, united the Fork Bombo cartel. In their case, for example, apart from other tools, they also use W Agent, another commercial freely av available um, software for remote access control, and Python keylogger co called CocoLogger. They also connect the creditors. So whenever they use W agent, they have to use the infrastructure from the uh, from this service. <clears throat> and GrabZone general description, but later on after our case studies, we'll see how the GrabZone cluster looks in 2020. So in general, they use backdoors like Matterpreter, PS Empire, Caesar Red, uh, Rotnetter. So they experiment. You, you can see that they do not attach to one of the tools. They experiment. They mix the tools probably because they want to um, have very low AV detection. They do not focus that much on some uh, obfuscations on evading AV in a technical way. I rather they seek for new tools that are not that well known, that they do not have the signatures, and we'll see it later on during the case studies. Apart from freely available RATs, they use also um, commercial software for remote access control like AnyDesk, Root, Simbot, and again, they use the keylogger. So this is quite common for, for different groups. They use Hail Mary keylogger. And, and they also target the financial sector, a very successful group. <clears throat> so let's go to the first case study about the Python keyloggers. So we'll also analyze the, uh, the initial, the origin of the keyloggers from the Fork Bombo cartel. Um, and this is one origin. There is a main function probably copied and pasted to the original keylogger of the Fork Bombo cartel. Um, that's how you utilize, how, how you use keylogging in, in Python. Even the uh, variables were not changed and you could see that the same variables are present in different keyloggers of different groups. Um, some parts are also not changed and are common among those keyloggers. For example, the name of the file where the logs are sto stored, so all the keys that are uh, pressed by the victim, is usually named after the username, so after the, uh, after the victim username. And you can see also the commented section in the green and where previously the Fork Bombo cartel used to exfiltrate those logs to Gmail. And that's why the, the name of the, of the cluster come from, Fork Bombo. Later on, they decided to, to leave the uh, archive with the, with the logged keys uh, on the machine and exfiltrate it using the command control channel. <clears throat> And you could see on that picture the comparison between the Coco Logger, which is a um, tool from the consultants, and the Land Cruiser, which is a tool used by Silent Cards. That there are many similarities, and uh, the, the changes are very slight. Some parts are commented, some imports are commented because 
uh, they don't use them anymore or maybe they experiment with some exfiltration to FTP but generally the the way they lock the uh, the keystrokes and the way they they form the log they create the log is is the same among different versions uh, of those african keyloggers and those are those are common artifacts that i gathered for those afts Th those files are usually quite large because the the python scripts are compiled to exe files with pyinstaller the file names are masquerading known software like OneNote, adobe exe and they are usually located by adversaries in program data. However, the logs are saved to program data, but they could be also located in user profile or all users profile. And this is also a good threat hunting hint that often adversaries put files, they, they use those locations as their staging uh, folders. And this is a good also threat hunting rule that you could try to detect if there are any files created there because usually there should be a folder structure and not not single files located in the in those uh, directories and the file names are often based on the username and the extensions are different it could be an uh, different archives or renamed extensions to some uh, system files like enesis and those keyloggers usually have ram keys persistence so very simple not sophisticated persistence in the registry and that's why those keyloggers are run after every uh reboot of the operating system <clears throat> um is it possible to easily detect such keyloggers uh usually not because uh, they are compiled by the pi installers so there is a runtime environment for the script so you cannot uh, try to create yara rule for specific uh characters that you could find after the compilation of this to this Python script. However, there are quite unique imports in the script. And uh, for example, I used I used them to to hunt for those keyloggers. It's very hard to to find the keylogger for a very for specific group. But with this Yara, for example, you could find a, a group of keyloggers that are with. Uh, high confidence associated with the African threat groups. And later on, after the compilation, analysts could, um, could gather more information and apply a second Yara rules to the decompiled script and then cluster the, the malware. So you could see that the core, the origin of the keyloggers is uh, uh, is unchanged and usually there are small differences and also small differences how they use those keyloggers how they choose the directories um, so this is quite quite common now we will focus on grabzone infrastructure and their capabilities from 2020 Actually, we'll try to analyze one of the IPs. And this IP was found in one of the public resources from Onet Services. I, if, you, if this topic also finds you interesting, uh, I really recommend uh, visiting their webpage and uh, reading their materials, which is a often fascinating uh, story. So I found this IP and I tried to analyze if there is any information that I could gather more and reach about this IP. What are those new Python free backdoor capabilities of those groups? That was my analytic question. So if we go to Shodan and especially the, the beta version, which offers the history in its GUI uh, and uh, really recommends trying beta version of Shodan, not, not the old one, uh, because history of the previously indexed information is very useful during such investigations. Is there anything interesting? 
for sure, ports like 3306, 3389 could be very interesting because those are ports connected with uh, MySQL database, with RDP. So if we, if we check those uh, unusual ports, we could learn more about infrastructure, about previous actions of this threat group. Generally, this IP belongs to the hosting, which, as you can see on the screen, very often offers some um, VPSs, VMs, uh, focus on offensive security capabilities like Kali Linux, Parrot security, Tor hidden service also, for example. So it is also very important to know that such a group prefers this type of hosting because whenever in later in investigations uh, we'll gather new data, this could help us to support our hy hypothesis, for example, if, this IP, if the next IP belongs to that group and if it is also the same hosting, that this could be an indicator for that could help us to support our hypothesis. So if we check the RDP on that, on that uh, on that host that was served uh, several weeks ago, we could find out that there is a, a message related to the National Bank of Kenya. So probably what the advers uh, adversary did was that they tunneled out the access to the computer inside the National Bank of Kenya and they accessed that workstation after tunneling out this traffic. So this is one of the indicators that they successfully uh, breached this financial institution. <clears throat> and if we would like to analyze what was on port 8080, which was associated with this new Python 3 backdoor capabilities, we could find out that there is not much information, something about uh, something from August, something from July, and probably not related to this backdoor, because as far as I learned, this backdoor was used in the beginning of the year. So what kind of backdoor they are probably using? If you take the strings that are also available on this website, you could easily find the, the project on Google. There are only seven, uh, seven hits in Google and there is an iChair shell project on GitHub. This is not, not human resources project, but a, a backdoor with a server component written in Python, in Python 3 actually. <clears throat> And, and it could be used on many of the platforms like Linux, uh, Mac OS, Windows. Uh, it has the capabilities also to validate the client and you could also filter out the, the client. So maybe there is not much information on this C2 that we analyze because the, uh, there was a kind of a firewalling. <clears throat> but if you take the same string, which is quite unique, and there were only seven hits in Google, and you check it on VirusTotal, there, there is also not much, only two files with those strings, but you could see also the detections. And have a look, there are only, after the compilation, compilation of this Python scripts to exe file, there is only one AV detection using the static signature. So probably that's the reason why the Grabson group tries to utilize new capabilities and tries to find something that evades uh, AV detection. So what about uh, C2 server component? Can we learn something about it? Are there any traces on this IP related to this project. So this is a Python based uh, HTTP server. Uh, and I, I found only one indicator in January that this could be uh, 
the time when the project was deployed and, and was active. And you could see the header connected with Python 3 and the, and the project Werkzeug. So on the above pictures, you have um, parts from the source code. And uh, below, you have the HTTP response from the one of the uh, from the IP that we analyzed and is attributed to to grab zone in this year. So I tried to play a little bit with this project and tried out tried out to to find a way if there is any possibility to to fingerprint this um, C two server and maybe to to find new instances maybe to track if anybody in on the internet is using that kind of capabilities. So when I used curl for experiments, I received similar headers that I saw on this IP that was belonging to GrabZone. Of course, the, the, the version of Python was different because I had different environment, but other headers were quite similar, or almost the same. <clears throat> So just, just to check generally how many Werkzeug servers are deployed in the internet, there are like 160,000 servers. If you look for this specific version, the, the number is quite lower and quite manageable. It's about 300. However, if we take those headers, which are quite unique to this uh, this project. The the numbers are being filtered out, and and later on, I I also try to analyze the source code of the C two component, and there is uh, one resource registered the the commander. So whenever you send the get to the commander URL, you receive the 308 permanent redirect, not very popular HTTP response. And this permanent redirect uh, redirects to the commander with slash at the end. And then you receive HTTP response 200. So with, so this kind of a behavior that when you send the get commander without slash, you, you get 308 permanent redirect, and then you send the, the right get to the commander with slash and you receive uh, HTTP response 200. This kind of a behavior is something very unique to this uh, Python C2 server. And with this knowledge, it is very possible to, to search in census, to search in showdown for those servers, because in this case, I'm trying to find out what servers are giving me the response 302 because this is the response uh, when I when I set the simple get to the root and I only focus on 302 and if I want to be 100% sure I can then send the get to the commander URL and uh, be uh, absolutely sure that there is a I, HR shell server behind. That was the example of a search for census. This is an example in the syntax that is used by Shodan. So generally, I'm looking for the specific headers, but I'm not looking for the response 200. This response only happens when you send the correct URL. And in this case, Shodan senses are sending just the, the, the most basic gets to the root. What are other C2 fingerprints on this IP server? Can we learn more about the adversary? What, what kind of services they used this year when they were operating with this uh, server hosted um, there? So there is quite unique subject for the SSL certificate. And when you take this subject and try to search the database for SSL certificates, For example, in, in census, there are only two IPs that are currently hosting 
uh, SSL certificates with such a subject. One is our well-known IP that begins with 145, but there is also another one and hosted in the same IP address range of the OVH hosting, which rents place to the, to the second hosting company that, that offers VPSs. However, this second IP, uh, I'm not sure if it is uh, related to Grabzone, but it's always worth for Thread Intel analysts to mark such information. And maybe later on, when we, when our investigations gather more data, we collect more information, maybe later on we could connect uh, this new IP with Grabzone, Grabzone cluster. Uh, and in Thread Intel world, we also use very often um, markings with uh, with our confidence level. So we could mark it with, it with very low confidence level. This is the IP that possibly belongs to, to Grabzone. And maybe later on, when we get more data, more confidence, we could change this assessment. <clears throat> and there are also other interesting C2 fingerprints that I found related to this IP. Actually, on another port, there were there was another re HTTP response with such body, a get file not specified in URL. And when, when I took this string uh, again into the Google, I found only one uh, one response there was a blog post about a man who showed how to create a file server file server in golang language and to to host files so it looks that the adversary adversary took the code and hosted this golang server just to serve the files um, they only did small modification they added some http response headers and my, my opinion is that they added those headers because uh, they use this server to download files on the victim machines using their browsers, so not using the C2 channel. And th those headers are there to, to make sure that the browser does not um, send any, any warnings, that there is a um, problem with extension and the MIME type. And uh, that's why those extension problems, file type problems are neglected. So if you take this specific string, you can only find currently one, one IP address well known to us, but whenever they decide to use it again, this type of service somewhere else, probably it would be quite easy to, to find them if they decide to, to continue this capabilities on different infrastructure. <clears throat> Using Shodan, there is very convenient way to use the, the hashes of the responses. Shodan hashes the response and you could use the hash and the result is also the same. So the, this service is served on two ports on this IP. Mm, some other hints about hunting their, their tools. For example, the, the client part of the HR shell after the compilation with the Pi installer to, to Windows executable, there is a manifest file in, in the resources. And when you try to look, uh, try to find for other samples that have the same manifest file in the resources, you only find the HR shell uh, samples. For example, the, it, is, it is that manifest file, very unique to this project. And when you search for these resources, for example, in the virus total database, in the latest indices, you get only 15 files and all those files are compiled um, HR shell compon uh, client component. Is there anything else suspicious on this host? Yeah, there are some more interesting things uh, that were hosted on this IP. For example, in February, in March, April, there was such a response. Probably some of you that are 
uh, familiar with offensive security frameworks, they know what kind of uh, tool that could be. So this is a default uh, metapreter uh, response. Mm. In January, on this on the same IP, there was a PS Empire hosted. This is a very also very typical default response from the PS Empire C2. However, I do not associate this activity with this Graton cluster. Why is that? Because the the fingerprint of the SSH. Uh, so we had today the presentation about fingerprinting very interesting and uh, fingerprinting is very useful uh, in our daily job so in this case we we know that the fingerprint of the ssh service was changed on the 24th of january so and it was present uh, till now and everything before 24 could be a different build of the operating system. It could be same actor that reinstalled the the software, but uh, we can't have uh, even moderate confidence for that. So up to now, I do not include those information that this is belong that this could be related to the African threats. It could be to totally somebody else, even the red team. In December, there was also a something interesting this is a typical response from the cobalt strike is it same actor we don't have hard evidence for clustering that could be somebody else that that uses that uh, one cloud hosting so generally what we learned about grab zone uh, summary so the capabilities they use they use hr shell from other samples from other knowledge we know that they use RG, RG rat free. They use still Metalpreter. They use RDP tunneling with probably NG rock. So when they uh, bridge the, organi the victim organization, they try to tunnel out um, some protocols to have easier access uh, to their infra infrastructure. They, they use tools downloaded via victim browsers because they use the file server written in Go. Uh, they, we see that they prefer such uh, infrastructure created in the hosting company named Cloud One Host. Uh, they do not use domain-based infrastructure; they use only IP-based infrastructure. And about something about the victims. So, through the analysis of their infrastructure, we we learned that they were probably successful against breaching National Bank of Kenya which was also um, supported by, by later evidence and different other sources that, yes, that the grab zone was successful in, in breaching them. If you also feel interested in, uh, in those subjects, I really recommend going to Onet Services to this, uh, so to the blog of the company that uh, really fights those, those threats and they don't only support them with incident response um, you could see that africa threat landscape is quite unique and you could meet many of the techniques that are not very popular somewhere somewhere else like this hardware additions and on the other hand and defenders are also working uh, the other way around because people from honest services are often have often uh, the authorization from government to hack back, and they also hack back the C2 infrastructure of the adversaries. And lots of the samples are gathered from the from such uh, offensive network operations. And I have to admit that they are very brave people because they are uh, fighting them locally, and the threats are uh, and the risk is is quite real. It's not a, like a simple analysis of, uh, of threats when you're sitting miles away. They conduct very close proximity operations against those threats. And those, those gangs have big support from the politicians, from corrupted policemen. So, uh, yeah, and so very interesting and, and great chapeau bas to, to those people. Uh, who fight AFT groups and 
thank you all for for watching uh, for listening hope you are also interested in this new thread landscape new for me maybe also for for you too thank you